We've got special guest here, Richard Holdner, who's like the king of the Big Bang, making huge power on stock LS short blocks. And that dates back to, I think, 2011, right? Yeah, it goes all the way back to 2011, that first story for Hot Rod Magazine, that little 4.8 that we thought was a 5.3, turned the boost all the way up on the stock short block. And it made what? made 1,208 horsepower, which was pretty impressive back then. And actually, we never broke it. It came off the dyno and it was still running. But ever since then, you've been like the king of go to get a junkyard motor, put a top end on it, and boost it till it blows, well, right? as soon as we do something cool for Hot Rod, then everybody wants to jump in, right? So the truck and magazine guys call and say, can you do the same thing with a 5.3? So we put a 5.3 on, turn that thing all the way up, 1,300 horsepower, which is a big number, but we saved the best for last. Okay. Turned back to Hot Rod and said, hey, we want to do it with a six liter. So this time we're gonna run six liter, same thing, stock short block, heads, cam, and intake, 1,482 horsepower, 28 and a half That's pounds. with a six liter, not a six two? That's a six liter. Okay, and what we're trying to do on this episode is actually beat that record because you're claiming that's the record for the world's most powerful stock short block, right? Well, I haven't seen anything, either LS or any of the other engine families that have made that kind of power on a stock short block. And as you know, all of those were Gen 3 motors, this one is a Gen 4, it's supposed to have stronger rods and a better block, so since we always break the rods on these Big Bang motors, hopefully this one doesn't. This thing goes a little bit farther. Each turbo is feeding a single intercooler, but it's a dual core, dual pass intercooler. We've got waste gates for each one of the turbos. Right now they're running on the springs. It's all controlled, and all we gotta do is adjust our little bleed valve as we do that. More boost, more fun, more power. Explain though, how the organized leak is gonna increase boost pressure. Okay, well, the way the wastegate works is it supplied boost pressure. That opens the valve up, that allows exhaust to escape out, and that lowers the boost pressure. If we trick some of that flow by putting a metered leak in it, yeah. now it thinks, oh, I'm not getting as much boost, so therefore I have to stay closed longer, so then the boost goes up. So as we keep screwing that thing out, we get more and more leak, more yeah. and more boost. Well, let's make the screw fall out. <laughs> <laughs> also, we got an intercooler going on here with ice yes. water flowing through it, and we're maintaining the ice at every pull. We're like dumping a new bag in, and you're gonna pull some of this water out so we can yeah, chill it. More down. ice, less water, more yeah. cool, more power. Should we adjust? Uh, you can adjust. All right. <laughs> Step two two and a half more turns. That's it. Go. I don't know what to Got tell nothing you. Else to uh, nothing else. It, it's like 1150, so easy. I think we'll go 1200. 1250. Yeah, exactly. See the numbers. I was pretty. Con I was concentrating yeah. quite a bit on air fuel. I was too. I was looking at that. And, and a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Step two: 17.6 pounds of boost, 1,213 horsepower, 957 pound-feet of torque. Let's go have a peek at that. Major failure, wow. I think we can fix it. All right, this is what happens when you really crank the boost up, blew the inlet tube off. So we took and welded some seams on here so it's gonna hold better. So we'll put it back in, get back to dynoing. Now's when we're actually kind of getting cautious. We got one and a half more turns. We only need 50 horsepower. And you're pulling timing at peak torque in order to try and kill that, you know, peak cylinder pressure yeah, and make the thing take, live. You can't take too much away, but it's yeah. down there, it's down there like 15, 16 degrees through peak torque. Yeah, and you so. can't make it 10, right? No. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. All it needs is 50. Deep into the 1500s. 
This next episode of Engine Masters is gonna be kind of different because it's very personal to me. I needed to build this engine in order to fulfill my need to enter the 200 mile an hour club at El Mirage Dry Lake. And so I've got 347 cubic inches of small block and it's gotta make a thousand horsepower. So the displacement is not really the only unusual thing about how I've set this up. Here's an unusual thing. I've had a wrench sitting on the intake manifold the whole time. Perfect. Uh, the other thing that is kind of weird about this as a race engine is that the plan was not just build absolutely the most power I possibly can. Instead, it's about overbuilding the engine so that it can handle the thousand horsepower I need to make without really shooting higher than that. My goal is always overbuild and then make the thing make less power than it's really capable of so that everything is completely reliable. As a result, the bottom end is incredibly expensive and incredibly trick, and the top end is stuff that is not full race. It's more like high-end street-level stuff, and we'll get to that. The bottom end needs to be beefy because while guys are making a thousand horsepower on LS engines with turbos all the time these days, I don't trust a junkyard short block at wide open throttle for more than a minute at more than 7,000 RPM making a thousand horsepower because if parts fall out, they catch on fire. And at 250 miles an hour, that's a bad program. It takes a long time to stop. Parts can throw out of the block and go through a tire. Then you're barrel rolling the car. And so really it is a safety consideration and it's about reliability. At Bonneville, you have to run five miles to get a record twice. You have to do it once in order to qualify and once to back it up. That is a lot of effort on the short block. And here's how I made sure that it was gonna live. The block itself is an aftermarket unit called a Dart Little M. It's the beefiest small block Chevy aftermarket block you can get from Dart. Billet main caps, the whole shebang. The crank and rods I custom ordered from Crower. The thing that makes the crank trick is not just the super high quality, but also that it has a big block Chevy snout on it, which is larger diameter and stronger and cut with two keyways to survive the loads of the supercharger being driven off of it. And that means that it also has a special timing chain and a special front cover on it. By the way, this front cover is from Mylodon. Everybody asks me about that. All right, now for some real power. What I've got here is a Pro Charger F1A94, and this unit's good for right around 12 or 1300 horsepower. We're looking to make around a thousand with the small block Chevy, and uh, it mounts right here. The centrifugal supercharger is much like a turbo, but instead of using the exhaust to drive it, it's driven by the crankshaft. Now here we've upgraded the drive from a typical serpentine to a cog belt, and that eliminates any possibility of slip. Now the crankshaft at max speed is gonna be at 8,000 RPM at this engine. You have a drive ratio between the drive gear and the driven gear, but also inside the housing here, we have a step-up ratio. This one is 5.4 to one. In other words, for every turn here, the impeller is gonna be turning 5.4 times faster up to a maximum speed as indicated on the data plate here of 74,000 RPM. We're gonna get this hooked up to an intercooler and then into the air intake, into the engine. And we'll see how much boost it puts out and we'll evaluate the whole system on the dyno. Yeah. Hey, Brule, what's going on here, man? Is Freiburger in his trailer? I mean, we're, it's his motor, we're doing all the heavy lifting here. Makeup. Makeup? Yeah. Oh man, he's got to look his best. He's trying to put that red helmet back on that he had when he was 15. Oh yeah. <laughs> we have the tune-up right on the engine. We have made sure everything was mechanically okay, but the air is not quite as good. It's warmer, plus there's more humidity or moisture in the air. So we're gonna do a pulley change to make the blower spin a little bit faster to compensate. And then we should be making the power that we're making with this engine in our original testing, the baseline. As if by magic, the Pro Charger shows up on the engine. It's actually a super easy installation. Three bolts hold this bracket onto the front of the cylinder head. And then we just have discharge tubing here going through our massive, like, I think 2200 horsepower capable air to water intercooler. And uh, Pork Chop's working on plumbing that. Good. 
Was it good? Yeah, I saw it like uh, 1075. I was kind of pegged left eye on the air fuel meter and right eye on the motor. Uh, now, I know these days you can go get an LS engine and throw a turbo on it, and you can make a 1,000 horsepower, and it's no big deal. But there's no challenge in that. And because I am the flip-flops and big blocks kind of guy, I decided to do it with a naturally aspirated big block Chevy. You do not want a 4,500 stroke in this deal. So the core of it is a 4.375 stroke crank. And the thing is, at RPM, that doesn't dip down into the oil as, as much. It doesn't get as much of a windage problem, and it's gonna last longer. It's also in a tall deck block, and the reason for that is basically piston ring stability. I'm gonna be able to run a 6.7 inch rod in it and still have a piston that has a 1.3 inch compression height and doesn't even have the pin up into the oil ring. So ring stability is a big part of the reason why we chose that. Now let's talk about the specific components involved. And I have to thank race winning brands who has helped me out a ton with this because no lie, this is some very expensive stuff. Starting with, this Dart all aluminum tall deck block. Now obviously the aluminum feature of it is gonna save a ton of weight off the nose, but there's a whole lot of other things that are trick about this. The bore in this thing is 4,600, and I have chosen the complete Dart package Well, they will prep the entire block for you and ship it ready to assemble, so that's a huge help. What I'm gonna show you now is some of the specialized components that are gonna go on the outside of the engine that are a little bit different than your conventional big block Chevy. I'm gonna kick it off with the oiling system. If you saw episode 56 of Engine Masters, you know that we made big horsepower and improved our oil pressure curve with a very trick Moroso oil pan. And that's why these guys are our new best friends for oiling. This pan's actually a little bit different than the one that we used before because it's not two-piece, it's a little bit cheaper. I thought I would end up using a flat dragster pan, but these guys advised that the sumped pan like this actually helps oil control and deceleration. And so this is more of a conventional chassis car type pan. However, there are some differences. First of all, this windage tray is a little more unique than what you might see in a standard street pan, mostly because it's got these dividers in it. This divides the pairs of connecting rods on the throws on the crankshaft, cylinders one and two, three and four, five and six, seven and eight. By separating them like this, you get even more oil control. On the oil pump, Moroso makes a bunch of very cool billet pumps. This is not like a regular cast housing that you would see on one of our normal performance buildups. Now, to be honest with you, I don't fully understand what they've got going on in here. I asked them about the oil pumps because they make like six or seven different part numbers on them, and they looked at what I was going to do as far as clearances on the mains and rods and bearing diameters and RPM, and they picked a specific oil pump for me. I guess my best advice would be if you're doing something radical like this, call them and get the advice on which pump to use because there's a bunch of them. And finally, it is all together in one piece. And there's some more trickery to show you. So the 582 is now loaded with a Moroso vacuum pump, which you can see here. You can buy from Moroso all sorts of different versions of this. They can advise you on what's best, including the drive unit. What this does is it works almost like an old school smog pump. There's veins inside it so that when it spins, it creates a vacuum. And you can see we've got it plumbed to the valve cover here. So the whole crank case inside the engine is gonna end up pulling about eight inches of vacuum. And that tends to help piston ring seal. And it also helps with oil control. Now, looking at some of the other accessories here on the top, we've got a 1050 CFM Holley Dominator carburetor. This one is an XP model with really cool features, including the fact that it's aluminum, which has merit. It's significantly lighter than the old zinc models. Now, the other thing I wanna point out is that this is not some boutique frou-frou custom tuner magic guy carburetor. That is Holly straight out of the box. See, the jet extension is so that when you're on the drag strip and you launch and all the fuel goes to the back of the bowl, it's still picking up fuel. There's two kinds. There's a kind that threads into the hole and then the jet threads into that, and this kind where the jet just falls out like that. This jet is, ooh, that's a 94. Interesting. I was worried that it was gonna be like a 96 or a 98. 
Usually when you have a really big jet, like let's say a 98 in it, you have to make a bigger change because when they approach 100, the changes get less and less sensitive. In other words, if it's 100 to begin with, you might have to change six to make it change. But with a 94 in it, we can change four and make it change. Yeah. That was a thousand plus. Yeah. No. <laughs> that was the one. Whew. <laughs> I saw those numbers just flying up like yeah, counting me up. Too.